Tonight's lead story is the termination of government's contracts with auditing firms KPMG and Ngongi. The two companies did work on behalf of the Auditor General on public sector contracts. The Auditor General, Mr. Kimi Magwetu, joins us now. Good evening, sir. Thanks very much Good evening. for coming through. Good evening, Debe. Let's start uh, with uh, KPMG. Why did you do what you did? You'll recall, uh, Vuyo, if you cast your mind back to 2017, there was the whole matter that came up from KPMG International, which raised a number of issues that the firm committed to investigate. If you recall, there's since been the Nsebeza inquiry, which was established by the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants. But alongside that, there was also an investigation that is also currently underway uh, handled by the Independent Regulatory Board of Auditors. So once those decisions were made in September last year, we obviously were informed and it was triggered by the media reports, but we went in and undertook to engage with the senior leadership of KPMG at the time to say to them there are certain unanswered issues that will affect the level of independence that we have always associated you with. But at the same time, it will also possibly affect the ethics as well as the professional competence with which you do this work. Because these are the two fundamental pillars that any audit office needs to rest on in order for it to be trusted for executing the statutory audit work. We then said, and we came up in public and said, based on the fact that we have not gone to the depth of whether these are mere aberrations, or whether they are indicative of a systemic breakdown in the risk management and practice disciplines, which ensure that you continue to be independent and continue to provide that particular service ethically and with professional competence. So we said, while we do not know the answer to that, we'll give the investigations that have been undertaken a chance. And we have been on that path we never shifted from that position. We held that position up to most recently. When it came to light that in a different engagement, and that engagement is the VPS engagement, there have been matters that are no different in qualitative terms to what we had been waiting for in terms of these ongoing investigations. Now the issue for us was what is the quantity of evidence that you need in order to act on what has arisen now. Because there's an investigation that's underway that is likely to answer that unanswered question as to whether this is an isolated matter or is it indicative of what happens there. And now VBS. And now something else comes up which points to much deeper issues in respect of that question. Now. Where do we stand in this whole matter as an audit office? We dish out work to almost 40 private audit firms in the country, including KPMG, Ngongi, and we've been doing that for the last 20 odd years because of issues of capacity as well as the economics that impact on whether you can have all of those people under one roof, even though you've got to focus on one or two financial years. So we looked at this and we said, but the risk that we have assumed by waiting for these reports to be finalized is now increasing. And we're going to end up with the, with, the, with the responsibility because they are signing these reports on public funds on our behalf because we are allowed to contract out this work. So that risk has actually increased in our view. And we said instead of waiting for the reports to be finalized because even the reports there is no certainty as to when they are going to be finalized. In the meantime they will be processing reports and signing reports and we decided that the best for us to protect the integrity of the National Audit Office is to take the step that we have taken and say we will wait for you to come back as soon as you can with the finalized reports so that once you have we will be in a position to assess whether you continue to be independent or not. And on the basis of those reports, whenever they come in the future, at least we will know that we have maintained the risk exposure to acceptable levels in our case. And that's the reason that we have taken the decision that we did. So it was a decision that had 
uh, had to come because of the enhanced level of exposure, not only to us, but also to them as a firm, because some of the issues that we, are, we were asking are yet to be answered. Well, the chairperson of KPMG only, what, a couple of days ago, Professor Wiseman Gush was talking about how they are giving these matters attention, uh, all the attention that uh, they deserve. The new CEO of uh, KPMG has, been, has also been saying pretty much. I think it is fair <clears throat> for the leadership of the firm to say that because that's exactly what they need to do. But on the other hand as well, I think we also have a, equally a responsibility to respond to risks, especially when they are increasing at the scale that they are. So I think by fixing what they need to fix, no one must fault them for doing that. But at the same time, they must allow us to independently assess the extent to which we have the appetite of the increased risk. And I think there will be a meeting of the minds further down the line. If all these matters are sustainably answered and resolved, then we'll be able to sit around the table and say, we think the risks that we were facing have now been substantially mitigated or not. But that's KPMG, Ngongi. Um, Vuyo, let me also deal with the Nkongi matter. I saw a, a, a line on your screen which speaks to the fact that we saw some media reports. Let me clarify the fact that we saw the media reports and the media reports were a trigger which got us to do exactly what we did with KPMG. We called on the leadership of Ngongi to sit with us so we can understand at a deeper level what this transaction that we read about was about. Because remember these two fundamental pillars of independence and professional ethics and competence are very important in the survival of our profession in general. Now when somebody enters into a transaction and the ones that are left behind do not have the answers that we have passed on to them, in respect of what is the nature of this transaction, what is this transaction doing in respect of issues of independence and other related matters, those answers would not be forthcoming to us. And for that reason, we felt that the risk of continuing to have the reports signed with that brand name is obviously going to be even higher because members of the public, including the public representatives, will have a right to ask us why do you subject the institutions that we have oversight over to an independent scrutiny by an entity whose independence has been raised as a question in light of the transactions and other related matters that they have entered into? For the same reason, if they were to come back tomorrow and say, here are these answers that you are looking for, and if we are able to assess these answers to determine whether that independence has been restored, the audit office will assess the situation. But now we're saying all of these investigations that they are attempting to trigger are going to take a life of their own. We have absolutely no idea how long they are going to take, neither today. In the meantime, we have a responsibility for the South African taxpayer to make sure that the minimization of the risks associated with independent reporting on public finances continues to be at a low level. And that is the basis on which both decisions were taken today. Now, both companies have been doing work for your office for a number of years. Um, a lot of opinions that you have expressed have uh, been based on the work that they have done. What does that mean? What uh, for the integrity of uh, the opinions that we've already expressed over the years? We have to separate the issues. <clears throat> There's the issue about the firm, the brand, the signature that gets onto an audit opinion which will reflect KPMG or Nkongi Inc. The people that deliver that work based on our assessment in terms of quality assurance processes that we undertake when that work is completed. We have not found fault in that. 
So we separate the issues between the people who are inside the institution who do their best to exercise professional judgment on a matter on a number of issues and come to conclusions that are acceptable as against a overall cloud, if you like, over the institutional mechanisms that ensure that that particular professional competence and ethics of those individuals continue to be safeguarded. The decision that we had taken is not casting aspersions on the quality of that work because it has been tested. We have found it to have been rigorous and accepted it and concurred with it when it was presented to us. In other words, you're saying you are vouching for your quality assurance measures. In other words, none of the misdemeanors, the unprofessionalism, or the, the compromise in either ethics or uh, competence levels would have tainted the work um, that you have, to, to, you have had to do or you have had to sign off on. Let me reinforce that point by saying <clears throat> If you are owning the shares in, K in Kongi, maybe the two of us, 50-50, and we decide, and we know that we are chartered accountants, both registered as such, and we subscribe to the Code of Professional Conduct of the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants, as well as other regulations that govern the conduct of auditors, the minute we sell, it's not like you are selling a fish and chips shop. We ought to know who is this person or persons to whom we sell. Because behaviorally, these new owners to whom we sell might have different ideas about how they instruct our audit teams to actually go and audit the audit institutions that we are responsible for with a mandate that is, not, that is unofficial. That's the key issue. That's why I'm saying, <clears throat> if that owner is going to have unrestricted access to the people who are part of that institution, they may decide to instruct them otherwise, particularly if they don't have to subscribe to the codes of co professional conduct that CAs are required to. We needed to get to the bottom of the answers to those questions. We are still none the wiser. And that's why we took that decision, because it then introduces what we call a pervasive risk in the environment, not a risk limited to a particular file. For example, it's not a risk limited to DBSA. It's a risk that pervades the environment, the culture, the disciplines, the orientation, the conduct that will subsequently emerge when those people have to be out and do field work. We wanted to get answers to those questions. In the absence of those questions, we then said, let us withdraw the audit mandate while you seek these answers so that we can get to a substantive conversation about whether there is or there is no remaining risk. And so that decision is consistent, even though it's affecting them in a different area, but the principles surrounding both these decisions are consistent in our view. And they are about protecting the integrity of the profession overall as well, not just them, because as you know, <clears throat> all of us as chartered accountants and auditors and accountants, we've been hung to dry in the public because this thing that we do sometimes is not as simple as other people would surmise. And therefore, we need to start making some actions to make sure that we answer these things step by step. Part of this step is also to contribute to the overall response that the profession ought to be taking in different places.